Hi Manchester and welcome back to the Carla Garrick Show. It's episode 34 and I am thrilled to be here with you. I hope everything's going really well in your life and I am uh, wanted to share some information about some of the projects I'm working on uh, before we get into the depths of today's show which will be uh, I think the New Hampshire Democrats are losing their minds is kind of this, the theme, uh, but also just Democrats in general. Uh, we'll be talking about Hunter Biden's laptop. We'll be talking about censorship. We'll be talking about the Fifth Circuit decision that just recently came out with regard to censorship. And uh, before we get into all of that, I just wanted to tell you a couple of books that I'm reading at the moment. Actually, this one I just finished. This is, uh, that joke isn't funny anymore. It is written by one of my favorite authors and one of my friends, actually, Lou Perez and I. That joke isn't funny anymore on the death and rebirth of comedy. Uh, the, the little marker here is because Louie, my husband, is reading it currently. I just finished it a couple of days ago. Uh, I believe this cover is from maybe a Smith's album, like Meat is Murder or something. So it says Comedy is Murder. Anyway, it's available on Amazon. And I highly recommend anyone who is interested in sort of the notion of where free speech is, what is wokeism, why is it uh, becoming a super unfunny world, and what can we do about it? Of course, the answer is what we can do is let people be free. Free speech is free for everyone. And you know what free speech means? It means you have to let people say things you might not like. Here's another notion. Do you know that humor, for the most part, is kind of wonky, right? Like that's what makes it funny is that you, uh, you're you saying stuff that might shake someone up or it might be a stereotype or it might be insulting or it might like just, you know, kind of break your brain a little bit. But that's the point of it because universally speaking, if we can laugh about stuff, then life is good. It helps us to process. It helps us to understand stuff and all of that. So uh, that joke isn't funny anymore on the death and rebirth of comedy available on Amazon. I will see if Lou actually can join me. I've been on his podcast a few times. You can find all his information, of course, online. The other book I'm currently reading is the classic Art Spiegelman's Mouse. Now this uh, is a, well, it's a hard read, guys. I read it years and years ago, but I'm getting old enough where I'm starting to forget what I know. So I like to go back and just really, uh, you know, reprocess some of this stuff. It's called The Survivor's Tale, My Father Bleeds History. Now, for those of you who do know, this, of course, is a graphic novel. It is one of the uh, most famous graphic novels ever written. It is quite uh, beautifully illustrated with a terrible, terrible story. It is a story of Jews in Poland during the Second World War, how, uh, how they had to uh, navigate Nazism. Uh, lots of people ended up in Auschwitz. It's super depressing, honestly, every night when I'm reading it. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's a hard read, but I think it's really important because we are at the stage, I think, here in the States where we actually have to be internalizing a lot of this stuff. Because shockingly, and, and this just I don't even know what to do with it. It feels like we have two sides who are literally just yelling at each other that they're fascists and they're Nazis and everyone's just calling each other names. But here's my question. If both sides think that the other side is fascist and crazy and Nazis, then maybe there's a, something wrong with both sides. And so I think that that is something we have to talk about and explore, which sort of brings me to today's main topic. I want to talk a little bit about Hunter Biden's laptop again, about censorship and, uh, and you know, whether free speech is, is worth preserving, I guess. So last week, uh, I saw a trailer for My Son Hunter. You can find it and maybe I'll even uh, cut it in here. So, uh, here you go. 
So I'll tell you what's going down. Do you know who I am? They told me you were VIP. Well connected to the government. What kind of a moron forgets to pick up his laptop at a repair shop? You're a Biden. Act like one. Everything he built, his life, I just ruined it all. I want to know everything that's on that laptop that can ruin my erection. My friends, it's time to party! I'm an artist. Tell me how I can help you. Well, I don't deserve help. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been through worse. You're the smartest man I know. Thanks, Dad. I just wish I could smack some sense into you. I'll never forget Cory Bob. He was a bad dude. No joke. Dad, we were talking about suffering. I can't seem to find anything but positive stuff on the Bidens. Who's the point man for the foreign policy in the Obama regime? Joe Biden. So it looks like you need a billion dollars. So the obvious next question is, where's Hunter? I can remember getting paid some money, but I can't remember what for. Well, my dad says we never discuss my businesses, period. Or my cut. What's happening in there? Joe's in on it. Party's over! <laughs> you had everything, Hunter, and you threw it all away. You hope the laptop will take down everybody with you. Get out! China's not our enemy. They're not bad folks, folks. I love my dad, and I just want to make him proud. I am the one who brings in all the deals. I am the one. The boy. So my son, Hunter, you just watched the trailer, and you know, as you can see, I mean, for acting, for the story, I'd probably give it five or six out of 10. But for the actual facts and sort of linearly putting together what happened and why everyone, regardless of which side you're on, should be concerned about what happened in 2020, um, is the movie is pretty good for that. I found the movie on YouTube. I watched, you know, three quarters of it and then I had to quickly pause it to run an errand in the yard. And when I came back, that version had been taken off YouTube uh, through, I'm gonna assume, censorship of some form. But I checked this morning and it was available. The full movie was available on YouTube. If you can't find it there, of course, try something like Censor Proof Odyssey, which is a place where you can find all my videos as well. So, so this movie, again, you know, the acting's okay, the storyline's okay, but really what it is important to note is that it sort of sets out this timeline to tell you what happened. So in a nutshell, here's kind of what happened, right? So in April 2019, Hunter Biden took his laptop to a Delaware repair shop. Um, the Delaware repair shop had it. He never picked it up. Their uh, terms of service says if you leave it there after a while, it becomes the property of the repair shop. So all of that was legit and above board. In September 2020, someone, um, and I believe it was the repair shop owner, but I'm not 100% sure on that, sent a copy to Giuliani's lawyers. Okay, so then the New York Post in October 2020, now you remember this is a month before the 2020 election. Now we've all lived through the 2020 election, so you kind of know what that means. The New York Post wrote what turned out to be an entirely factually correct piece of reporting saying that the son of the now president of the United States of America had this laptop, which folks, I'm sorry, it's gross. Like not just the drug use and the cocaine and the snorting coke off like people's butts and like just stuff where you're like, whoa, holy moly. Um, like you have to ask yourself what level of narcissism or dysfunction or, or, or whatever 
must you be suffering under that not only are you doing this behavior, and I have a lot of empathy for Hunter. He grew up in a political home. That can't be easy. His uh, mother and his sister died in a car accident when he was very small. His brother, Bo, died of cancer. Yes, those are all blows. I get it. But also, you know, your dad's the president of the United States of America now, and, you know, he was beat before that, so... You know, your life doesn't actually suck that much. So what dysfunction is there that not only are you doing these actions, but that you are actually recording all of it all the time? So the Post article comes out in October 2020. Then there's this mass movement and everything is silenced. Why do I care about it? Here's why I care about it. Because I got censored. Like I, you know, I follow the news, I share stuff, I like to, you know, spin things from a liberty perspective, I like to keep people up to date on sort of what's happening, but I'm also not that vested. Like these teams aren't, you know, so much my teams, I kind of think everything's rotten at this stage. So, um, so I shared some information and I shared stuff that I was finding from the laptop because I've got, you know, clever, interesting people I follow on the social media channels. And I was like, wow, people should know this. Look, 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 look at what this is. And then I hit my censorship and, um, and that annoyed me because, you know, I don't think anyone, anyone for any reason should be silenced, even if they're a Nazi or a racist. And you know what? In the olden days, even the ACLU used to agree with me. I mean, there's a famous case from the 70s where the ACLU actually defended the rights of Nazis, like real Nazis, American Nazis, to march, right? The Skokie case. And so bad speech should always be allowed so that we can crowd it out with better speech. So the New York Post article is taken down, everything's silenced, there's this push that comes out where people say, hey, this is Russian disinfo. Now this, of course, coming from the surveillance government, from our intelligence agencies, who haven't named a source in so long that I think they're just genuinely caught up in their own lies at this stage. I mean, frankly, I think the government doesn't even know what propaganda to believe anymore. I actually think we have different departments that are functioning on other people's uh, propaganda. And so it is literal madness at this stage. Now let's talk about that madness just for a moment. So, when we look at the rules of this country, this country is ruled, its rule of law comes from the U.S. Constitution. This is an important and groundbreaking and incredible document, right? So it sets out our rights. It sets out, well, our rights, by the way, are inherent, right? Like we're born with them. And really what this does is codify it. The Constitution is actually written to restrict the government from doing stuff. But somehow all of that has been flipped on its head as well. So, so the US Constitution is an incredible document. It is the rules of the law, uh, it's the rules of the land, and it was this groundbreaking document that is supposed to restrain the federal government. Our rights as humans are inherent right? That means you're born with them. No one's like, oh, you know, I'm your master and I give you your rights. You're born with them. So the Constitution is there just sort of to enshrine our rights and to be like, hey, federal government, we have these rights. Remember, we have the right to free speech. We have the right to our religion. We have the right to keep and bear arms, all that good stuff. So here's a right that we don't actually have. You don't have the right to abortion. Now, before you lose your mind, I'll make this really easy for you to understand. Show me in the Constitution where the words are that say you have the right to an abortion. Because the words you have the right to free speech is in the First Amendment. The right to keep and bear arms shall, shall not be infringed 
is written there. But here's what happened. In the 60s and 70s, America kind of lost its mind, right? We stacked the Supreme Court and we started to make this argument that the Constitution is a living document. Now let's just hold up for a second again. I actually remember when I heard that term for the first time and I was like, that's crazy because a contract, which is what the Constitution is, right? We're saying that that is the social contract. That's a contract between you and your government, blah, 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 right? How can a contract be based on whatever we think at the time? That on the face of it, prima facie, is insane. Because imagine if you and I entered a contract. I'm selling you my car and uh, it says it's a Ford, 1980 Ford, I don't know why. All right, and then uh, if, if that contract says I'm selling you a 1984 Ford for $100, and then if we could have living contracts, i.e. whatever we think at the time, then I could be like, well, now I'm gonna sell you a uh, a, a Fiat 1979 for $200 and you just got to eat it up because, oh, I'm just going to make up new rules for how it works. So I hope at a minimum you can agree with me that arguing that the Constitution is a living document that evolves as we evolve is crazy. So it is crazy and we shouldn't accept that. So Going back to the Hunter Biden story. So recently on the Joe Rogan podcast, Mark Zuckerberg admitted that the FBI contacted Facebook, told them that the, the story, the New York Post story about the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinformation. And Zuckerberg admitted that they uh, suppressed the story, meaning they uh, they pushed it down, deplatformed it pretty much. And we know for a fact that Twitter actually just like took it down. So turns out that uh, it wasn't Russian disinformation. The story was true and that they basically changed or possibly at a minimum changed the outcome of the 20. 20 election. So there's another clip online that you can go find. It's pretty good. It is a hearing, congressional hearing between Senator Hawley, youngish guy, talking to someone from Facebook. Uh, his name was Chris Cox. And uh, in this grilling that's happening, the senator is kind of like, so you guys are uh, just, you know, circumventing the First Amendment on behalf of the government, right? So just to stand back for a second. So here's what it is, right? So the First Amendment applies to our relationship to the government. We as people have the right to free speech. A platform like Twitter or Facebook has been arguing they're a private company and that they can make their own rules, right? So they're saying, well, we have these community standards and if you don't live up to these community standards, which is a private contract between you and I, then, uh, then we can kick you off. Now, from a contractual perspective, that is actually correct. But here's where it gets interesting. What the government is now doing, which by the way is definitionally fascism, is the government, is using the big corporations like Facebook and Twitter to censor speech they don't like while pretending not to do it, right? So what, what, what um, Zuckerberg admitted um, and what this guy at the congressional hearing, uh, Chris Cox, admitted is that, yes, I mean, we are basically doing the government's dirty work for them. That is a problem. So some of you may be familiar with Section 230. So this was a, a, a law that came in years and years ago. And basically what it said was, if you are a online publisher, then you cannot be held liable 
for whatever people post there. So that was sort of like supposed to be like a free speechy kind of thing, but it was also negotiated to protect companies from getting sued by people for other people's speech, right? So in the same way that maybe uh, someone tries to sue a gun manufacturer uh, if their gun is used correctly in the execution to kill someone, um, like it or not, I mean, that, that's what a gun is designed to do. Um, or a car is used in a car accident then kills someone, you can't go sue the car manufacturer and you're not supposed to be able to sue the gun manufacturer, but people are trying to circumvent that, but that's a conversation for another day. So in the same way, you couldn't use the publishers to, you know, you couldn't go after the publishers for speech you didn't like. So that was the notion behind that. But now, what they're doing is they're both claiming the right not to get sued for stuff, but also saying, hey, but we're just going to censor speech we don't want. So they're basically using both sides. They're playing the game purely in their own favor. So this week, actually it was last week maybe, it might have been Monday. Anyway, recently, a Fifth Circuit decision came out. So there are nine circuits, and these circuits are the appeals courts that are right under the Supreme Court. So by way of example, my, uh, my big court case that says you're allowed to film cops, you're welcome, was a First Circuit decision out of Boston. So it was, you know, I appealed and they appealed all the way to the First Circuit. And, um, and so this was a Fifth Circuit, I believe that's out of Louisiana and that area. Um, decision just came out where they basically said, hey, you know what, Twitter? You can't really uh, continue to make these two arguments. Like you kind of have to pick a lane. Either you're a, uh, you know, either you're censoring on behalf of the government, i.e. you're acting as an agent of the government because you are censoring certain speech at the behest of the administration. Uh, or not. Now, I think this decision is going to end up being appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. In fact, I have no doubt. I think this is going to be the biggest case we're going to see uh, for a while. But um, I found it really interesting. I was just Googling it earlier. And the language that people are using around this issue is pretty interesting. So I Googled... Um, Fifth Circuit, First Amendment, social media was the Google terms I put in. And the first hit I got was uh, the Brookings Institute, which is a, uh, you know, communistic uh, institute, uh, written by a guy who I believe was working for the Council for Foreign Relations or at least affiliated with them. So that would be like the uh, New World Order, World Economic Forum, those guys, right? Um, the, the headline actually said, uh, this case is like really bad because it is free speech absolutism. Now, it's all going to come full circle. Bear with me. Remember earlier when I said that you can't show me the right of abortion in the Constitution uh, because it's not there. But, you know, the lunatics are actually claiming something that isn't there. Uh, on the face of it, while also saying that the words, you have the right to free speech, is not absolute. Now, if you can explain to me how that is not the definition of insanity, I would actually appreciate it. Because I don't understand how people can hold these views like how do you justify saying oh we have this right that isn't there and that right is absolute the right to abortion but this right that is written there that is in plain black and white that anyone can read the words to is somehow not an absolute right do you see that those two things do not make sense so that's basically why I'm saying, to me, it just seems like everyone is a little insane, but on those issues, it's a democratic issue, the, the abortion issue, it seems uh, really, really 
Looney Tunes to me. So the other thing that was Looney Tunes is I saw this thing this week and I don't even know what to do with it. I mean, it's just, it seems crazy to me. It was an attack on free staters, but where they, the, I don't even know what it came from. I only saw the screen grab of the words, but the words included that uh, free staters are Manchurian candidates. For anyone who's confused, a Manchurian candidate was actually a metaphor or a character that was created in the 50s, and it was to fight Chinese communistic brainwashing. So pretty sure I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a Manchurian candidate. I am a Manchester candidate. And if you like that joke, go check out the series I'm doing. So I started this little post-it series. It's called My Life. And it's really my life in balance. And it's just these little things. And they're supposed to be cute and funny. And I'm just going to do them whenever the vibe strikes me. But they're out there. And you can find them on Twitter um, and on Facebook. And, uh, of course, you can always find me on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram under my name, Carla Garrick. Um, and I put most of that content on my website, CarlaGarrick.com. So in this same little blurb that I saw that mentioned the Manchurian candidate, it also said that we are assassinating democracy. I have no idea what that means, but I will tell you this, it's probably gonna be the title of this video because that is just a crazy sentence. Um, so to wrap this all up, I guess this is one of Carla's more rambly ones, but you know, my point is we are seeing this censorship that is coming down because they can't hide all their lies anymore. And there are so many lies that if you pile them all up, it becomes really, really hard not to be persuaded or convinced that the federal government is garbage and that it needs an entirely fresh overhaul. So they censored the Hunter Biden's laptop story and they were wrong. So anyone who followed those fact checking, they lied to you. Wake up. The other thing that just came out, the Lancet uh, put out a study this week that says, oh, it turns out COVID lab leak theory actually entirely feasible or plausible please do go look up the words furin cleavage site f-u-r-i-n this will probably be taken off youtube because of that so it turns out lab leak theory that i said 28 months ago looks like i was right um so don't let the bad guys win. Don't let them lie to you. Do your own research. Listen to people like me. Vote me into office so that I can go help fix the problems at least on a local level. And don't forget to join me every week right here on Manchester Cable Access TV as well as on my YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button, please. Subscribe, share, like, give me some love. I really appreciate it. You can find all my content at carlagarrick.com. Thanks so much for joining me, guys. I'll see you again next week. Take care. Live free and thrive.